When I first read uh, the galleys that Dick Zanna gave me of the Peter Benchley book, Jaws, came back the next day, read it that night, came back the next day, and I said, I really want to direct this. I hope you can hire me. And uh, at the time, there was another director attached, and I wasn't, he said, I'm not going to be able to hire you. I wish I could, but there's somebody else involved making Jaws. And then circumstances prevailed where I had a, did have a chance to direct Jaws a couple of months later. But I said, you know, I really want to make this because this is Duel of the Sea. Not only that, but a Polish poster of Duel that had the truck with a huge mouth like a shark. The, the, so the whole front of the truck was kind of open like it was about to scoop up the car. We were called out to see the first shark test, the first time the shark was going to be in the water and was going to, you know, perform, you know, like Esther Williams. And and so Dick Zanuck and David Brown and I were in a small uh, support boat. It was like a Boston whaler. And um, the shark came out of the water beautifully. I mean, it was supposed to broach, breach, and head first and explosion of water. And it did that. It came right out perfectly. And then the head kind of went back down like a submarine. And then there was an explosion of bubbles. And then the tail came up in the other direction, tail first. And then the tail sort of fell over that way. There was another explosion of bubbles. And then there was one final explosion of bubbles. Then it was eerily quiet. And we actually were witnessing the shark sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And at that point, uh, Dick and David turned to me, and Dick said, well, I'm sure they'll fix it by morning. And the next morning, we got the word that they were going to be down maybe three to four weeks with the shark. Uh, that's when I realized, okay, plan B. Now, I never planned for a plan B. But that Monday, I suddenly had to improvise a plan B, which was basically to make the film as scary as I possibly could by suggesting the shark without having to show the shark. And that became my motif for the rest of the picture. I promise you that if the shark had been working that first day and Chrissy Watkins had been taken in that first scene and the way my storyboards had, I had a fin in that shot, I had a conical nose coming out of the water, never seen the whole shark, I had a tail. Had there been any evidence of the shark, even on the scene where the pier is pulled out and comes back again and chases the swimmer back in, the fisherman, I promise you the audience wouldn't have leapt three feet out of their seats and thrown their popcorn into the air when the shark came out when Roy Schotter was chumming. You wouldn't have had that shock had the shark been used too often and too clearly before that. Slow ahead. I can go slow ahead. Come on down and chump some of this shit. The shark not working when we needed it to work probably added $175 million to the box office. Because I think what's scary about that movie is, is the unseen, not exactly what we see. And we do see the shark. It's shocking. Verna Fields, a tremendous film editor, would surgically cut a frame off the head of the shark and cut a frame off the tail of the shark. And those two frames made the difference between the shark looking like a great white 26-foot-long predator or looking like a 26-foot-long turd. When you think about how hard it was to get that crew in those boats, being tossed around by six-foot swells, or sometimes even worse, flat lake-like conditions. It was so tedious and boring where the mosquitoes c came 12 miles out just to bite you. Kill it, please. Kill it! Now! Shoot! Yeah, everybody told me not to shoot on water. I mean, everybody said don't do it. Sid Scheinberg even said, well, I should build a tank on the back lot. We'll pay for it. And I said, no, I want to go out and I want to battle the elements and I want people to think this is really happening, that shark is really in the ocean, I want a real ocean. It was something that I will never forget. It was something that I don't want to repeat, and you probably noticed I haven't done very many water movies since Jaws. The experience of making Jaws was, was horrendous for me. I don't want to sound ungrateful because I'm completely grateful to the audience embracing the movie and the movie being such a phenomenon, which basically gave me what I had always dreamed about was A, being a movie director, and B, having Final Cut, and Jaws gave me freedom.
here's the message. We're going to implant this message in your brain. If you have any ambition about learning more about yourself, you're going to follow your God-given instincts, and you're going to follow all the signs, and you're going to get to the place where the party is going to occur. All I was interested in was Einstein's theory of relativity and space-time continuums, and I just love the idea that if they were truly taken off our planet, they could come back the same age as when they were hijacked in the 1920s or 30s or 40s. But I didn't have any backstory or I didn't have any other motivation other than it was really cool to have the people from Flight 19. I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if they came back at the end and then a whole new group of astronauts go off with them again? He was chosen. They sensed something in him that they felt they would learn more about the human race from innocence. Maybe he was like a child himself. And at the end of the story, the Richard Dreyfus character, who sort of acts like a child throughout the whole picture, because he returns to his childhood to actively pursue his dream at the expense of his responsibilities to his family. And maybe it's the child in all of us that the aliens were more interested in observing and investigating than the astronauts who were trained to communicate with a higher intelligence. The difference in when I wrote the story in my 20s and what I would have done today is I don't think today with a, being a dad of seven kids I would have let my Richard Dreyfus character actually get on the mothership and abandon his family to this to this alien obsession and leave the planet. I'm not sure I would have done that today but 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 in my 20s it was something that was absolutely would have been my choice get me on that mothership I'm curious I want to explore along with these guys. George came back from Star Wars, a nervous wreck. He didn't feel Star Wars came up to the vision that he had initially had. He felt he had just made this little kid's movie. And he came to Mobile, Alabama, where I was shooting on this humongous set. And George hung out with me for a couple of days and looked around and said, oh my God, your movie's gonna be so much more successful than Star Wars. This is gonna be the biggest hit of all time. I can't believe the set and I can't believe what you're getting and oh my goodness. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll trade points with you. You wanna trade some points. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two and a half percent of Star Wars if you give me two and a half percent of Close Encounters. So I said, sure, I'll gamble with that, great. And uh, I think I came out on top of that bet. <laughs> I think I did a lot better than George. Both of our movies were wildly profitable. Close Encounters made so much money, rescued Columbia from bankruptcy, and the most money I had ever made on the movie before was from Close Encounters. Close Encounters was just a, a, a meager success story, and Star Wars was a, a phenomenon. And of course, I was the happy beneficiary of a couple of net points of that movie, which I am still seeing money on today. <laughs>